Welcome to Inside the Crease, the podcast from Power Hockey Canada, dedicated to the power hockey community, showcasing the sport, the players, the coaches, and the unique and inspiring stories of life with a disability that break down barriers. Now, please welcome your host, Matt Vecino. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this edition of Inside the Crease, presented by Power Hockey Canada. I'm your host, Matt Vecino, and I'm joined today by Emmett Ritten. Emmett, how are you doing today, buddy? Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, 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 a great, it's a great Saturday. Sun's out. Uh, not too much snow on the ground. Uh, and sure. thank you for of course. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, so, obviously, you've been involved in the sport of Power Hockey for a number of years now. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got started in volunteering with the sport? Absolutely. So um, I'm 26 years of age, going on 27 this year. Um, Mm -hmm. I started about 13 years ago. So essentially, I've been a part of the sport for a half my life. So um, it started when uh, a a childhood friend, Mike Laval, he um, asked me at a very young age if uh, I could volunteer um, in order to do uh, basic equipment manager stuff. Um, So, you know, tying sticks to chairs, um, assisting the coach with whatever he needed, collecting balls after games, um, anything that the coach needed help with. Uh, there was just too much responsibility for one person on a bench to do. So Mike for asked sure. if I was able to help out on Friday nights. Um, I was a little young at the time, so that's why Shane has kind of got involved as well. Um, he didn't think that I was ready enough for that responsibility. So the both of us kind of went in there and coached. My dad went in and coached the team, and I was in as an equipment manager and kind of helped out wherever needed. Um, and it's just evolved from there. Yeah, so I guess that would have been, said, 13 years to 2008. Um, at, at what point did power hockey and para sports become something that you enjoyed to something that you felt was like really special and a part of a part of you? Yeah, like when I was 13, 14, I was entering high school. So <clears throat> I knew I needed to complete, you know, the 40, 60 hours of yeah. very volunteer hours. So I'm like, this is a, this is a great way to kind of chip away at it early on. And, you know, I, I, I've always had a strong, strong passion for the sport of hockey and sport in general. Like currently I'm uh, studying an undergraduate for sport management. Um, it's sport has just been something that I know can transcend society, can set great values and norms for for people to follow, and just cr- it can create so much uh, happiness and goodness in this world. So, um, when and specifically with power hockey, um, I would say when I had my own team in house league, uh, I was given that responsibility at a very young age. I think I was about seventeen at the, mm-hmm. at the time, uh, and it was just a, a huge responsibility, a huge honor to, 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 to move on from, you know, being in my father's shadow to, to going and having my own responsibility on the team. And I think we won a championship or two that first few years. So wow. in combination with the responsibility, plus you're starting to see, you know, hard work come to fruition with championships and wins. And you see people buying into, uh, you know, my coaching ethic. And it was, it created so much motivation for me to, to take those next steps, you know, to move towards, uh, the Toronto Toros or the Toronto Rock at the time and look at international games that the passion really grew when people started to invest in me, uh, the, like Bob Cassidy, like Paul DeSaulnier, Randy DeSaulnier, um, Alex McLean, a lot of these, a lot of these key members of our community started to truly invest in my development. And, um, it, it was just natural from there. So that's where uh, my passion really grew for the sport. For sure. We're, we're definitely going to come back to your coaching career and, and whatnot, but I wanted to step back a little bit. And and you mentioned that when you started getting involved in the sport, uh, you're only 13, 14, just beginning high school. At that time, what was your relationship like with people with disabilities? What did you think about power sports and how has it changed uh, since you've been involved with power hockey? It's a great question, Matt. Um, at the beginning, um, I, I hadn't had previous experience with members uh, with it, other than Mike Laval, there wasn't very many people I was interacting with who had physical disabilities. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I played sport my entire life, so I just saw this as a way to, you know, gain some of those volunteer hours, uh, participate in a sport that I just have such a strong passion for, and uh, kind of give back to my community. But that's where it started off as at, mm-hmm. at a age. But to be honest, Matt, as as I started to get into our 16, 17, I think I attended and viewed my first tournament that uh, 
in 2010, I started to see just the raw talent in the sport and just be completely dumbfounded at such like I think it was 15 or something. I was really young at just how talented some of these athletes were. And from there, moving forward, um, and I took that back to how seek that experience. Um, I didn't see individuals in wheelchairs. I saw just true raw athletes. And it just has transcended from there. I, I really like that you talk about the idea of raw athletes and like the elite talent. Do you think that's a misconception about power hockey and para sports in general, where people don't necessarily appreciate just how talented these athletes really are? Yeah, uh, I absolutely. Um, you know, when, when you think of the sport of hockey, you you primarily uh, relate correlate that to you know the NHL, Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid, you know some of the the best. Mm-hmm. Um, hockey players on the planet um but i've heard so many stories over the years where um there was a gatorade commercial and uh there was a bunch of nhl players that were paired up with um sledge hockey players so it's not i've seen this and yeah you've seen that so nathan mckinnon had a conversation with a, with a 13 year old kid and he said hey kid if you can beat me in a race i'll sign your jersey yeah and you know he was having a laugh with it but um the kid said, okay, deal, as long as I can decide the race. Uh-huh. And the, 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 the kid said, let's get two sleds. And let's go and race end-to-end in these sleds. And this 13-year-old kid destroyed an NCAA athlete. And he won, and Nathan McKinnon was flabbergasted. Um, he had no words. He was speechless, and he was super happy that that, that, that this 13-year-old athlete uh, completely outsmarted him. And <laughs> I think just going back to your original question, yeah, I do think there's – just even in that one example, um, there is so much talent in our athletes at our level in the sledge hockey world and just in the para sport world in general. Um, some of the adversities that they have to get through in order to achieve the highest elite performance level possible is um, just an incredible thing to see. And I do think society do- undervalues the, the the commitment, the passion, and the um, the training that's required to to reach these levels in our sports. Now, it's obviously clear just from the few minutes we've been talking already how passionate and how how ingrained power sports is in your life. But obviously, you're a 26-year-old guy, like you said. You've been doing this for the last 13 years. Have your friends ever said anything to you? Like, Emmett, why are you spending your Friday and Saturday nights helping run a, a power hockey league? Like, have people ever questioned you? Questioned? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, they've been interested, and a few of them have come out and watched a few games here and there. Um, but they've uh, truly been supportive and like in a sense, like they, they're happy that I, I had these opportunities. And I think they truly value what uh what val- they, they value what the like what how this opportunity val- like brings value to my life. Um mm-hmm. they've seen me, you know, coach in again, whether it's a house league team for peewee hockey or it's coaching on a Friday night with uh, Power Hockey Toronto. To them this makes no difference. You know, they see that I have a passion for an organization um they see athletes they see a sport and they're happy that i'm engaged with it and furthermore like the fact that i've had opportunities to travel all around across the, around the world uh i haven't gone to the earlier australia tournaments uh which some of the other ones have but i was given the opportunity to i was just busy with school but i've traveled through north america travel uh facing some of the toughest teams and um my friends have been super supportive and excited for me to have this opportunity. And they think uh, even just as something uh, put on the resume as a future sport management major um, to be an advocate for para sport moving forward. They just think it's an excellent opportunity and they've been super supportive almost my entire life. Yeah, for sure. I like that you mentioned the the, uh, the countless tournaments that you participated in as a coach. Obviously winning numerous awards uh, for the best coaching staff and as well as championships. Looking back on your career so far, did you ever expect you'd have that opportunity to coach elite athletes in international and national competitions? And and what has that been like for you so far? Oh, it's I I can't say it's not one of the better the best experiences when I look back. Uh, the talent's so strong in North America when you get to some of these divisions out in Calgary. Ottawa's produced some great talent in such a short period of time. Um, you look down in the States and you have, you know, Michigan has some fantastic players. Chad Wilson completely controlled our sport for dominated, dominated it, uh, and changed and changed the, the culture of the sport with the shot and the way that he played. And so many people, players, you now see are adapted to that. Um, I think that's, that's what it comes down to, like traveling with, with, with the team. Um, there's two main things, like 
for the development of the team. It's been incredible to see how far we've come from the Rock to the Toros. Mm -hmm. uh, in about you know ten years, we we came from a six fifth seeded team to you know a championship contender every time we hit the floor. Um, obviously, sport isn't um, isn't determined before the matches are. It's not determined based on players uh, that are on the roster on paper. You have to actually play the games, and sometimes there are upsets. And you know we only we've only sure. won championships, and it's been a little disheartening. But you know it's just created such a close bond. And that comes into my second point with the players that have been on the team over the years. Mm -hmm. um, these are some of the best athletes I've ever seen in my life. And I truly consider them family at this point. You know, some of these players have been, have grown up with me. And I think my dad said it best a few years ago. It's, um, it's almost like he has 13 kids, not just two, because he's, he's, he's seen me raised around these athletes and these people. And um, these are lifelong friends that I've created. And between the, you know, the professional development and the, seeing the, the team develop and creating those relationships over time, um, it's just been an absolutely invaluable experience. For sure. I, I think one thing that you mentioned is it doesn't matter the sport. It always brings people together. And I'm glad that you touched on the point that these guys that you've coached and, and these girls that you've coached and developed the family now, like you have such a strong bond to these competitions, whether it be on the international stage or just the house league. Uh, I think that's amazing really. And just speaks to the impact that sports can have. Um, you touched on sort of your professional development. Uh, now you're the founding director of Power Hockey Canada. How do you see the organization playing a role in the future of power sport in Canada but on the international stage as well? And how do you think that uh, the organization will sort of help? Yeah, um, Power Rocket Canada was introduced about two years ago. Um, and I, again, the uh, various members of this community and um, wanted to do, invest in my development as a board director moving forward, seeing that mm -hmm. I was in a sport program. And I had, you know, not only that but i've also been a part of it for a long time um relative to my to my age and it's just been a great opportunity to to work on some of the marketing skills that i've been working on because that is something that's my postgraduate pursuit is to get into the field of marketing specifically sport marketing which is mm -hmm. a little bit general marketing so from my personal professional development standpoint um i love the sport i love the people i have the knowledge and i understand the culture of it um so being able to pair that with something that i'm working towards as a career goal uh has been just an amazing pairing and uh the other directors have been fantastic super easy to work with and uh it's just been a great group to to be a part of over the past two years um at the second part of your question i think you mentioned how do we progress the sport uh internationally and through canada yes uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of regions. Out, like, I feel that the sports very is target targets a lot of um, central Canadian provinces and eastern uh, Canadian provinces, uh, with some major cities that are that don't have divisions for power hockey. That mm -hmm. you know, have strong hockey backgrounds. You know, you have Vancouver, you have Edmonton, you have uh, the East Coast, the the, the, the Atlantic uh, provinces which love hockey. You have Montreal. None of these cities Absolutely. have teams. So I feel like with the dedication and the passion that our board has, we may be able to, you know, move into some of these cities with a little bit of time. If we find the right stakeholder groups and we find the right people to partner up with um, to to help grow the sport uh, and create the opportunity for sport to be played in these cities for para athletes, which right now there I'm sure there are plenty of organizations that provide sport opportunities. But, um, you know, we're in Canada. It's hockey is one of our major sports. Um, Absolutely. You know, it's it's a major sport internationally. It's growing. You know, states are a huge, huge, huge hockey presence, as is Russia, Finland, Sweden. But um, Canada, it's going to always be one of our favorite games and pastimes. So, being able to operate one of our divisions and maybe one of these major cities would be huge for the progression of the sport and for the sport in Canada. Um, on the international stage, you know, we've been attending a few international tournaments. Uh, we just returned from. Uh, Australia last year mm -hmm. and there's the year before that in 2018 or 2019 we uh, went to Italy nice. uh, which from the people that have come back and some of the interviews that I've had with uh, players and coaches who have returned it's just been an absolutely phenomenal experience and we want to continue to partner with our international these international governing bodies so that we can continue to provide these opportunities for our players and coaches and hopefully continue that growth on the international scale which is at this point, a very, very young stage. Yeah, so you mentioned, obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done in order to grow the sport on the international stage. But there's obviously been a lot of talk about trying to get 
uh, power hockey into the Paralympics. Do you think that's a realistic possibility? And, and what do you think needs to be done in order to turn that dream into reality, say, in the next five, ten years? Yeah, uh, I mean, getting any sport into the Olympic Games, whether it's para or just the regular, or just the, like the Olympic Games, are um, it's a very difficult task. Is it doable? Absolutely. Um, I think that's a goal of our, our of our board directors. It's a goal of our American friends down south, and it's a goal of most international bodies around the world. Like the the Olympics is the pinnacle of of Absolutely. sport, uh, especially amateur sport performance. So. Um, is it doable? Yes. Are there stakeholders around the world that if they came together and cooperated and moved towards a singular goal, would this ha- be able to happen? I think absolutely. The, the passion for, for parasport around the world is, is immense. Uh, I've met some incredible people who, who want to progress this, this sport of hockey for, for all participants. Um, and I think regardless of how tough these restrictions and guidelines and criteria are, I think there are some great people around the world who have met um, who, if we gain, if we came together collectively as a group, we would be able to achieve that goal. I totally agree. Uh, taking a step back a little bit, I mean, obviously you got involved in the sport at an extremely young age. What would you say to other young people that are looking to volunteer in power, para sports or power hockey uh, right now? Um, be open to new experiences. Um, I never knew that when Mike Lavelle came to me that day, hey, Emmett, we need a we need someone to collect balls and put sticks on chairs for players, that it would translate into a, to where I am today. So, you know, um, it's a, it's be open to new experiences. Um, even if, again, if you're, if you're doing it for volunteer hours or something that you're, you don't have previous experience with, um, it can, it can bloom into just an incredible, incredible experience. Um, and whether that's para hockey or it's para soccer or it's para, is it doesn't matter to me. Um, just give yourself that opportunity to try something new um, because it, it is truly an eye opening experience uh, in the sense that, you know, I don't see any of these athletes as anything less than athletes. And that's that was not sounded as kind of the the way I saw it going into it at the beginning. I saw as you know helping out with a, a charitable organization or non for profit mm-hmm. who whose main stakeholder group are individuals with uh, with disabilities, but that's not the way I see it anymore. And it's completely changed the way I look at not just the sport but you know life. So um, it was a fantastic opportunity and. Oh, for young people looking for volunteer opportunities, just just be open to new experiences because you have absolutely no idea what they'll translate into one day. Awesome. And, and obviously, you've been coaching uh, pair sports for a number of years, but you've also had some experience with able-bodied athletes. Do you think mm-hmm. there's a different approach that you have to take when you're coaching able-bodied versus uh, disabled or, or pair sport athletes? Personally, no. Absolutely not. Um, obviously, there, there's, there's going to be minimal. There's going to be some slight technical differences. Uh, mm-hmm. You might need an equipment manager who is taping sticks to chairs, which you might not need in able body sport. Or, for sure. And of course, you know, if you look at hockey versus soccer, it's two completely different sports that require different like, technicalities for the coaching staffs. But um, I think as a coach throughout the years, you you, you identify kind of what the, what the strengths and weaknesses are of the individual people on the team. Absolutely. Team achieves uh, how they move toward a goal. Um, and to, to be honest, as long as you can, you have the ability to identify the strengths and weaknesses of each individual player and you understand that not everyone learns the same. Some people are more visual learners. Some people are more, uh, they want to they see it drawn on the board. Some people want to just play it out in a, in a drill or... Um, some people then need to be a little bit tougher. Uh, so, uh, for instance, I had a player that I would consistently bench if they weren't listening to me. And it wasn't because they didn't want to listen to me. It was just the way they learned. And, I, and, I, and for me to put them on the bench, it was that symbolism, like you're not doing what you need to do to help our team win. Mm-hmm. Whereas with other players I've coached, I can just say to them, like, come to the bench real quick on a whistle, switch this, do that now, and they'll do it instantly. So I don't think think that there's a huge difference within the approach with able-bodied and and disabled sport um or parasport i apologize uh parasport no uh, as long as you as long as you identify the key strengths and weaknesses of each individual player and you cater your strategy to them because at the end of the day those are the ones that are performing on the ice or on the floor uh, or on the field or whatever sport you're playing 
And if they're not getting what you're saying, the you might not be able to win games. And I don't, I don't, I think that's transferable between any sport, regardless of ability. Yeah, I, I think one point is that at the end of the day, everybody's an athlete. It doesn't matter if they're participating in able-bodied sports or player sports. They're trying to win. They're trying to succeed. They're trying to sort goals. That's it's a shared focus and a shared mentality. So like yeah. you said, I think it's just coaching skills translate across all sports and and all different leagues. So it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah. Obviously, going back, you mentioned when you first started involved in power hockey, your dad was coaching and you were an equipment manager. Um, now, obviously, you're a coach and you've had an opportunity to work together uh, on the international stage, but also coach against each other uh, in the house league in Toronto. What have those experiences been like? Um, how would you say you work together? Um, and is there a little bit of a rivalry now that you guys face off head to head more often? Uh, my dad's one of my best friends in real life. Like, uh, he's, he's a phen- phenomenal father. Uh, great role model, but just a, an incredible friend to me over the past 26 years of my life. So I love kicking his ass, part of my language. <laughs> All good. And the course, I remember one year uh, when the when the Cibogo was starting to become a force in the sport, he was on my team and mm-hmm. I just, I enjoyed lighting Seamus up. So um, it's, it's fun. It's never, no hard feelings ever. When we play against each other, it's fierce. Uh, we're always chirping and yelling at each other across the benches i love that it's spectacle it's a spectacle uh it's funny we're yelling we're louder than the, the like yelling at each other sometimes uh louder than the crowds are so it's uh it's it's quite the spectacle to see at house league uh when it comes to tournament play we've luckily had i've had the opportunity and i'm very fortunate to have had the opportunity to coach alongside him um it's been nothing but a pleasure. Uh, we understand our strengths and weaknesses, and we are two completely different people with two completely different skill sets. So Seamus is more of you know the delegator, uh, the bench boss, um, someone that is consistently telling the like motivating the guys off the floor, on the floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm more of the strategist. So it's the the role of him as being as head coach suits him he does what he needs to do uh in terms of motivating but i'm sort of the statistician i'm looking at the stats i'm looking at the play i again i have a personal relationship to have growing up with many of these players that are on the team uh Mm -hmm. who are similar age to me i have those personal relationships so where seamus might have to put the fear into them if they're not playing well i might be the person to be the good cop in the sense that yeah um I'll pull like if if Seamus pulls a player off like you're not performing well I'll be the one with the with the clipboard being like this is what you have to do so yeah. and then you know in the car rides home we're we're talking about hockey until we get home so um or at a tournament we're talking the whole way back to the hotel in our hotel rooms over coffee like, what, and like Seamus what did you see there or I won't say, I wouldn't use my dad's first name but for the purpose of the podcast be like, yeah. Seamus, you know uh, like what 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 did you see there and we'll see different things and we complement each other very well and uh, I hope I get the opportunity to do that again for sure I mean it sounds like a, a great experience and a great uh, sort of coaching you uh, amongst the two of you um, taking it a little bit personal before we wrap up here obviously you mentioned you're studying sports management at Brock University what made you want to pursue a career uh, in this field in particular? Yeah, so I uh, I pre I am 26 and I'm finishing my undergrad. I had previously been at York University for a few a handful of years, and I was doing kinesiology, and it just wasn't okay. um, it wasn't that I wasn't able to complete it. It just wasn't something I saw myself doing for the rest of my life, and that was a very scary proposition for a young 20 year old Emmett. So I, mm-hmm. I took a year off, did some research. Um, I originally was planning on going into sport media at Ryerson. Okay. Uh, I know you graduated from Maddie. Yeah. But uh, in my interview, because it's a very extensive interview process to get into the program, I had a conversation with an individual who had come over from Brock Sport Management, and now she is one of the chairs of, of Ryerson Sport Media. Okay. And she, Have you, like, we'll, we'll take you here. Like, it's, there's no problem with that. You have decent marks. You, your resume speaks for itself. Uh, but have you looked into sport management at Brock? I don't know if you have the ability to travel outside of the city or live outside of the city. Mm-hmm. 
but I just came from that program. And just based on what I'm seeing and what you're saying to me in this interview, it seems like this might be better suited for you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's your decision, and I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but uh, you might want to go check it out. So, you know, I took that to heart. And so it's been, I've I met this person for a matter of 30 minutes, and it felt like she kind of knew quite a bit about me. So I, yeah. I did out there. And um, I instantly fell in love with the campus, the student population, the Niagara region, uh, which I've had previous experience with, uh, but never in the St. Catharines area, which is just equally as beautiful. Yes, I remember, absolutely. I remember going up into the faculty offices for sport management, and I just, every office, sport jerseys, you know, trophies, posters, you know, con academic conferences for sport management. And some, I, you know, like, I would, say like hey my name's Evan I'm a prospective student for this campus and just the way the professors interacted with you it just it made me feel wanted it, it felt like a, an absolute incredible fit I did a campus tour and just fell in love and uh, some of the best friends I've ever I, and some of my favorite my best friends have gone to the school I'm lucky so I've dated a few people here who um, just fantastic people that I've met over the last four years um, and then as I started to take a few courses in sport, you know, you have the, you have the law courses, you have the marketing course, you have the event management courses, you have the human resource courses. I just, I found that marketing was a calling that I just never realized spoke to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I consider myself a very social person, very easy to get along with, uh, who has kind of strategic vision for the future. Like I was telling with my, like my dad, I'm kind of the bent, like I'm doing the stats and whatnot. Yeah. And being able, as I was taking more and more marketing courses, I'm like, wow, I, I, I can't believe that this is something I could do for a living for the next 30, 40 years of my life. And, totally. you know, being able to work, you know, interact with uh, various sponsors, work with sport leagues, whether it's amateur, professional, uh, whether you, you, there's so many possibilities in the marketing world, working for big brands like Nike or Under Armour or Adidas, working on their strategy to help grow the brands and create consumer relations and giving back to the communities and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, I just fell in love with it, Matt. That's kind of, it kind of was one step at a time. I found the program, met the right people, found the passion, and it just has just grown and grown. And I'm super thankful for Power Hockey Canada and Toronto for seriously investing in me uh, at such a young age, and now giving me the uh, the responsibility of being a director for one of the national like the national governing body. And um, I'm super grateful because I don't know if I'd be here without the sport of Power Hockey. Honestly, I, mean, I have to say the passion's just oozing for you. Editing, whether it be about power hockey or marketing, you can tell that you're extremely dedicated to both. Um, before I let you go, we'd like to close out our Inside the Freeze podcast by doing a little segment that we call the Six Shot Shootout. Now it's time for the Six Shot Shootout. It's six rapid fire questions coming at you, so get ready. So essentially, it's a rapid fire section. I'm going to give you six questions that are like this or that type questions. So Say okay. pizza, pizza or burgers, you choose one. So uh, here's my first question for you. Scuba diving or mountain climbing? Mountain climbing. Steak or chicken wings? Steak. Yeah, you can't go wrong with either. No. Morning, morning or a night person? Night. Movie or TV shows? And what's your favorite genre? Movies and it changes, but right now I'm really into the mafia scene. Goodfellas, Casino, God, okay. Godfall, love it. Yeah, love so, it. So good. Yeah. Any uh, <laughs> any new movie recommendations for us? Honestly, I've been recycling recently. I think I've been on a huge binge. I did Joker last week, Shawshank Redemption, uh, John Wick. Yeah. Uh, Goodwill Hunting, uh, Django Unchained. So nothing new, but just recycling classics that classics, I just... Classics, yeah. Well, they're, li they're legendary. You can't go wrong with either of those. Any of them, yeah. Thunderstorm or Snowstorm? Snowstorm. And would you rather see the Blue Jays win the World Series in Game 7 at home or the Maybe. Toronto Maple Leafs? You knew it. You knew it was coming. <laughs> the Leafs? Go Leafs, go. Um, go I, I, I'm a hockey guy. I love I love my Jays. I love my Raptors. It was great to see the Raptors win in 2019. Mm -hmm. I was on that wagon watching every game. Kawhi Leonard, miss you. Yeah, the Jays are looking good. The Leafs are looking good. 
I'm not going to be falsely optimistic like I have in the past. I know what the Leafs are, just constant disappointment. But to see them win a cup in my lifetime would just be an absolute honor and treasure. Totally agree. What, 1967. So we're counting down the days until we win that cup. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully they bring it home soon. Exactly. Emmett, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Thanks, Matty. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on Inside the Crease, the podcast dedicated to the power hockey community. If you enjoyed today's show, please like, subscribe, and tell a friend. Visit our website at InsideTheCrease.com and follow us on social media at InsideCrease. 